Hey, well, good morning, everybody. We had a nice uh, little verbal countdown here. I appreciate that, guys. That was nice. How's everybody doing today? Good? Everybody feeling good? All right, good to see you all. Thanks for joining us here at Crossroads this morning. Uh, it's always good to have, have you guys and some fresh faces as well. So let's all start this, uh, the service with some music today, with some singing, and uh, let's stand together. to the sky but there's no space between you and I wherever I go I'm never alone I'm waking up I come alive the past is gone the future can next two songs I wanted to say real quick and it kind of uh, it just kind of came to my mind this morning you know we got close friends that are going through some really difficult stuff there's a uh, <clears throat> you know as you get older <laughs> it's uh there's more and more of that you know there's more and more 
of things that come up in this life that are hard, that are hard for you to deal with, hard for your family, hard for your friends. And it's, it's a thing to where you kind of start to reflect on your life and how, how everything has, in many, in many ways, a lot of times things have felt so easy and so convenient in a lot of senses, especially for me in my life. And now that we get, as we get older and your and family and friends and things change and things get harder, it's like you want, I, I've always want to just really ask, is God, God, are you really there? Like, God, are, are you actually with me? Those are the, the thoughts that I have in my life, and I think we all have those in some way. But as we sing this next song, it's called Your Love Never Fails, and then we're going to sing a song called No Longer Slaves. And unintentionally, when I planned these songs, uh, I, I wasn't thinking about anything specific necessarily, maybe just the message and how it kind of works with today. But, but when, we were, when I was talking about some friends who were going through, through cancer and through different things like that, it was like, man, that, I guess that's exactly what, what I was asking. It, are you there? And if so, do you ever fail us? But no, and the answer is no. He just never does. And now, that might not always look like how we want it to look. It might not be the end result that we, we really want. But there's something in those moments and in those difficulties where God is telling you, I am who you need. And I always will be. I will always be your strength. I will always be your source, no matter what. And then, when it, and then the following song, No Longer Slaves, is the fact that we don't have to be afraid because of that fact. We don't have to be afraid because God is our strength and he is our source. And we are no longer slaves to fear and anxiety and worry that this life wants to give us at all times. So as we sing these next two songs, just think about those things that we question and the hard things that we go through that no matter what, God is our source, and we do not have to be afraid of this life.
This one. Here's 
God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we get to gather together to be here, to believe that you are our power, you are our strength, you are our source of all things. And we're so thankful that you're in our corner, that you are in our lives, God, that you are a part and the daily integral part of who we are and, and the purpose that we have. Thank you so much that we don't have to be afraid. Thank you for giving us the strength and the confidence to, to live day to day and to go out and be a light for you. We love you so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to watch this fun little VBS video. Coming in July. Coming in July. We'll have more information next week about that. But we wanted to make sure the kiddos saw that before we let them go. So if I can have all of my pre-K kiddos head to that door over there. Pre-K kiddos. Wait, wait, elementary kiddos, wait. Let the pre-K kiddos go. All right. Good job, team. Good job, team. Thank you. Really good shirt. I need one like that. Okay, elementary kiddos, you can go to this door. It's a bummer that they hate their class. That's really sad how much they don't want to go. We should really work on that team. Just make a note. Kids don't want to go to class. Okay. Uh, 45 kiddos, if you are in the room, 45 kiddos, you can head on out as well. 45 kiddos go to our Vibe building for their class and then are welcomed back for you to pick them up over here so you don't got to walk all over in the cold. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Brian. Just want to welcome you. Thank you again for joining us. Um, just wanted to let you know before we get into the rest of our announcements, we had two amazing services last week for Easter. Um, thank you guys so much for coming and inviting and bringing people. I just want you to know, between the two services and our kiddos, we had 435 people come through. That's awesome. So keep inviting your friends, keep inviting people. Thank you to Mike for team teaching with me. That was so much fun. Thank you for celebrating 20 years of Crossroads with us. We're going to do a bigger celebration this summer, more information to come. Um, but coming up very quickly, our women's conference is coming up, and I don't plan it, nor do I attend it, and so I'm going to have someone who is doing both come talk to you about it. Uh, so you can hear from Miss Joyce as she comes, oh, and Miss Summer, as they come and tell you about the Women's Conference this weekend, right? Next weekend. Next weekend. They'll tell you. Don't listen to me. Hi, my name is Joyce Roberts, and I'm Summer Redman. And we wanted to take an opportunity to come and remind the ladies of the church that the Women's Conference will indeed be next Saturday, April 13th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So the conference is called Pretty Little Lies. We'll be walking through everyday lies that we often hear or tell ourselves, and we'll be refuting them with biblical truth. This year's format will be different than last year. Last year, we used a lot of videos. This year, actually, the ladies in the church, the crossword ladies, will actually be giving personal testimonies related to some of those pretty little lies. And there will be a book that you can take home with you as well. 
breakfast and lunch will be served, and there'll be multiple opportunities for worship and fellowship throughout the day, and a few surprises. So you can sign up on the Crossroads website or on the Church Center app. So you go to the sign-ups and to look for the pretty little eyes, click on that, and then just follow the prompts. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer your questions. Come and see one of us after church. Good to see you there. See you soon. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so much better than I do. So much better. Guys, not leaving you out. Okay. Women have their conference. Men, we are uh, planning to head to a men's conference on April 20th. It is the uh, Iron Sharpens Iron Equipping Conference. If we can get 10 guys to sign up, we get a discounted rate. Uh, it's, I've looked into it. Um, I know we had somebody, someone attend the one that was in Springfield, Illinois. This one's in Champaign. And so uh, just an awesome opportunity to gather with guys, to learn, to worship, uh, and to be encouraged. So if you are interested in that, there's a sign up on the information desk. Uh, and then Rex will be out there answering any questions that you might have about that. We have a baptism coming up on the 21st. If you have never been baptized, uh, and that needs to be your next step of faith, we ask that you sign up at the information desk. We will contact you and, and walk you through everything that's going to happen. But baptism is a symbolic step that shows an outward expression of an inward faith. And we uh, have the baptisms right here. And so if you haven't done that and you are ready, please sign up. Uh, men's book club, not men's book club, it's everybody's book club now. The book club. We are starting a new book this month called How to Heal Our Racial Divide by Derwin Gray. I'm about halfway through it. It has been phenomenal so far. You can always tell how much I like a book by how quickly I'm through it each week. I'm halfway through and it's only the seventh. So um, it's a great book. Grab it, read it, join us on April 27th at 7.30 in the morning over at the Vibe Building. We discuss it, we debate it, we generally start there, and like every good conversation, go a thousand different directions. So please uh, join us for that. Child dedication coming up on April 28th. We uh, don't do uh, infant or child baptism here at Crossroads. We do believer's baptism. But what we do is we do child dedication. And it doesn't have to be baby dedication. If you have come to faith and you've never... Um, had your child dedicated and, and they're young and you want to do that, that's absolutely wonderful. What we do is we have you up on stage and you tell us a little bit about your kiddo. And what we do as a church is we join you in dedicating that child to the Lord. And then the church commits to the best of our ability to helping every parent walk with their kiddos for as long as they walk with their kiddo. That's what I love about Crossroads is that we try and do that, and we diligently try and do that. So if you have a child that you want to be dedicated, again, please sign up out on the information desk. At Crossroads, we partner with lots of different organizations in our community. Uh, I have always been a big proponent of instead of trying to start something always, maybe just find someone who's doing it really well and just join them in it. And so that's what we do. And one of the places that we do that with is the Piatt County Food Pantry. And we want to thank Crossroads and the congregation for their re regular giving, which supports the GO team and the ability to send financial support to the food pantry. Um, April is set aside to collect items for the food pantry. There'll be a box in the entryway, and we'll have information uh, throughout the month of what the food pantry is needing and what different items they are looking for. If you want to give extra to the food pantry, that's wonderful. You can um, do a check or a cash and just drop it in the box. And if you do a... Uh, Check or cash, just make a note that that's where you want it to go to. Um, so this is Miss Jean Holmes, and she uh, is the one who we work with at the food pantry. And again, I think it's always best to hear from the person who organizes it and runs it because they can tell you the heart behind the ministry. So, Miss Jean. service this morning and for allowing me to come and to the most happy places, Pike County Ecumenical Food Pantry. I say ecumenical because there are many churches in Pike County that help support the pantry. Um, it is housed in a Methodist church as I am here, and um, I would like to thank each one of you who has given uh, coffee.
back to Barry. Um, I know this church has supported us with Thanksgiving and gifts for Miss Paul and many other ways. I wrote down notes so that I would not forget anything. There's a sign in the back in the on the back wall of the pantry that says, "Give us this day our daily bread," and that is our purpose. We are wanting to be sure that every family in Piatt County, every household, has bread for the day, and every child has food, and that is our purpose. And so um, the pantry is open for families to come on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, from 1 to 3, or that varies weekly. But we, they, have an, they call the church office. Each family calls the church office, makes an appointment, and uh, they come visit us, and they do their shopping. Uh, they don't just get a bag prepacked. They shop our little grocery store. And um, we're averaging anywhere from 16 to 20 families per week. Uh, unfortunately, that number is rising. That means there are more and more families in need. Uh, we do have volunteers who are there at the pantry to help with uh, navigating the process, help to carry out their f the food they have chosen. And uh, each family shops on their own. They don't have us hanging over them trying to uh, influence what they pick up. We offer a variety of foods. Most everything has been given to us. And in addition to the food, that we offer, canned and boxed goods and things. We also have household items, which is so special, toilet paper and um, Kleenex and, excuse me, tissues. I always stumble on that. Um, paper towel. We also have soaps, bar soap, laundry soap, dish soap. One of my favorite sections, we realize that so many people are diabetic or have health issues and need low salt. So we have an entire section that is devoted to no and low salt, no and low sugar, and it is very popular. Even those without those needs will shop that section just because they know it's more healthy. County Market supports us by giving us their day-old bread. On Tuesday and Thursday mornings, we stop by and they give us anywhere from one to four boxes of food, breads and uh, sweets and things that are about to expire. Dollar General has just joined us in uh, offering cold items. They change their refrigerators over as they get new trucks in and they give us the outdated or close to outdated uh, cold items. And so these are important in order to offer food for those who need food each day. In the summers, we are so blessed with those of you with gardens and those who give us their produce and their fruits. And uh, the master gardeners even give us little bouquets of the flowers that they grow in addition to the fruits and vegetables. Just something to help make your day better when you're going through trials and when you're going through hardships. Um, We have benefited from lots of different situations. The post office food drive, Bob Ross just gave me a call. Post office food drive is coming up the middle of May, and I know most all of you support that, putting out your food. Uh, that 
drive goes to all the food pantries in Monticello. Uh, it doesn't just go to the to our pantry. Um, the scouts, a lot of people with birthday parties will designate the food pantry as the recipient of the gifts. And they ask those to, don't bring a wrapped gift, bring, bring me a can, bring me a roll of toilet paper. Uh, the schools have helped. Cindy and her uh, fellow teachers have supported us greatly. One Christmas, they gave us 750 boxes of cereal. You can ask Cindy about the details. If you miss WCIA's broadcast of it, uh, such a blessing. We had cereal for a year. It was great. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Before folks leave after they've done their shopping, we give them a voucher for $40. That voucher is good only at County Market here in town. And the purpose of that is to purchase things that we do not supply. Milk, eggs, fresh fruits, um, anything that we don't supply is available. Of course, $40 keeps going less and less. <laughs> Goes less and less, purchases less and less. But it's a blessing to be able to give that. For those who do have uh, the, he the health problems, the diabetics and the health heart people, we give them a second voucher because we feel like our pantry doesn't have near what they need. Uh, the one shelf does not, the one bookcase does not hold everything that they need with their special need. I think that about does it. I just want to thank you as a church and individually for your support and thank you for what you're doing to help those who are hungry and to help those who are in need. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'll come take that from you real quick. One second. Oh, you were perfect. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Miss Jen. One of my favorite parts about what she talked about was the ability of the individuals coming in to shop on their own. Just the dignity that that gives to people. Because I've always thought it can make you feel rather small sometimes to be in need, which is ridiculous, but it's just kind of how our culture works. Be able to go into a place and be seen as a person, to be seen as a human being, and to be given the dignity of choosing what works best for you and your family, I think goes a long way. So thank you, Ms. Jean, for that. Thank you for everyone who supports the food pantry, and we're going to continue to do that uh, for all the foreseeable future. So, all right, we are switching gears. We are heading into a series called Hard Questions. And what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to look at questions that um, I've been asked, people have been asked, and we're going to see if we can provide some sort of reasonable answer to them. So this week and next week, we're going to ask the question, can we believe the Bible? I think it's a fair question. I think it's an absolutely fair question. If we're going to say that this book is the source of truth, that this book is the source of life, I think... It's reasonable to be able to defend that we can trust it and believe it. So today, I am super thrilled because this is so nerdy today. I know I look super cool, but deep down, I am a huge nerd, and we are going to nerd out today. So all of my history people, yes, everybody else, forgive me, that's what the Bible says, so you're going to have to do that. Now, this morning, I'm so excited to look at some history, look at scripture, uh, but before we do that, let's pray. God, this morning, thank you for everything that's going on already. Thank you for worship. Thank you for our team that leads us to you. God, they're not just playing music that we can sing along with. God, they lead us to you. I'm glad we found you this morning. 
You're not far off and you're not hard to find. Thank you for the food pantry. Thank you for the upcoming VBS. Thank you for the life that's going on in this church, the men's conference, the women's conference. God, thank you that you are moving in our midst even when we don't always see you. So this morning, God, as we look into your word and we look at history, I pray that you help us to see truth, help us to navigate these things. And so God, as always, uh, give us ears that are ready to hear, hearts that are ready to be molded, and feet that are ready to be moved into action. And God, anything that I say that's from me and my imagination, let it be forgotten before anyone leaves this room or logs off this video, but everything that's from you, let it stick forever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So last week, I got to team teach with Mike Heinegger, our founding pastor, and I was up here with a paper cup, and he was drinking from a really cool cup. And so from now on, I'm drinking from a really cool cup. So thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. I'm like, mm, that's cool. I'm going to have to do that. So <laughs> just so you know. So let's turn to 2 Timothy. Let's look into 2 Timothy. We're going to start in Scripture, and then we're going to dive into history and, and look at what I believe is one of the uh, questions that's been asked the most and asked in many different ways. Um, and it's like, how did we get this Bible that we have? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at two verses there and then one more in Hebrews before we dive into the history. 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 16, says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that tells you why we have the scriptures that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. That's why we have this book. That's one of the many reasons we study Scripture and read Scriptures, to be able to be proficient and equipped for every good work. And then just a few pages back towards the back of your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When we go to Scripture and go to it honestly, and we read it with the idea of, I'm going to do my very best to take what's in here and apply it here and here, this is exactly what happens. It separates our thoughts from what may be selfish from what is biblical, what is selfish to what is life-giving. And so, but how did, how did we end up with these? We're going to look at the New Testament specifically, 27 books. How did we end up with these? And I want to start with a quote from a theologian named F.F. F. Bruce. Anytime you see someone uh, use two initials for their first name, that tends to be their uh, academic um, title. So uh, another guy that I love is a guy named N.T. Wright. Anytime he's writing academically, it's N.T. Other times it's just Tom. But F.F. F. Bruce says, what these councils, these groups, these meetings, what they did was not to impose something new upon the Christian community but to codify, to, to encapsulate what was already the general practice of those communities. So we're going to look at the term canon, which is the uh, acceptable, followed, chosen books of the New Testament. Now, the first list of these 27 books was found in an Easter letter by a bishop named Athanasius in 367 A.D. That is really, really early. In the grand scheme of history, in the scheme of recording of events and details and biographies, 367 is an incredibly short time between the life of Jesus and what they're documenting and the writing down of things. Now, previous to that, in 170 AD, we have what's called the Moratorian Canon. Okay? It was this little 
a section of a larger work that was found, and it uh, listed lots of different ver- books of the Bible, and it's kind of the thought of as the first glimpse into what the early churches were using as scripture. And so here on the next slide, you can see all of the books or letters that are listed in this moratorium canon. So you have the Gospels, the Acts, the Book of Acts, Romans, both Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. You can read that. I don't need to read it for you. But there are three at the bottom that are unique to this list. There's the Wisdom of Solomon, which would later become uh, part of the apocryphal books, okay? So here we go. You've got the Old Testament, and you've got the New Testament. And if you grew up Catholic, you've got the apocryphal, okay? It's the middle part, okay? The Catholics hold that to be Scripture, okay? Protestants don't. We'll talk about that later, okay? Protestants see those as historical books that bring understanding between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but we tend not to see them as divine Scripture, so the Wisdom of Solomon is one of those books that that's where it landed, was in the Apocrypha between the two Testaments. Then you've got the Revelation of Peter, which uh, I'll be honest, no one has a clue what that is. Seriously, historians have no idea. They, they, there's some documents that they think, okay, maybe this is what, he, the, what they're talking about, but it's not found in any other list, any other historical document that talks about the New Testament Scripture. And then you've got... The Shepherd of Hermas, which is followed by a note that says, it's good, but it's not to be read in church. I love that. I love it. It's good. So you should read it. It's not in church. It's not scripture. And so you see already in, what year is that, 170 AD, that we have a list of books that are in circulation, a list of writings that are already in circulation amongst the early church that people are saying, these are different. These appear to be authoritative and powerful. And they were in use in the early church as early as 170. Now, the official church canon that we have didn't uh, become official until 393 AD at the Council of Hippo, which is in North Africa. All the church leaders and all the bishops gathered, and like F.F. F. Bruce said, they didn't say, all right, we're going to make these the scriptures of the New Testament because this is what we want to do. They got together and said, all right, you're using that, you're using that, you're, okay, we're all using these books of the Bible, we're already using these as scripture, we're going to make it officially official. And so that's what they did. And in that, you have all of the Old Testament books and all of the New Testament books. And in that first Council of Hippo, it also included um, some of the apocryphal books. So that canon included uh, books like the Wisdom of Solomon, Tobit, Judith, and all the Maccabees, which are great history. Okay, If you are interested in what occurred after Malachi and before Jesus, find the apocrypha. Read it. It's, in, it's incredibly interesting. It's got great history. The Maccabees is all about how the Jewish people revolted and got their uh, freedom back for a little bit, and then Rome came in and destroyed that. And so we have this beautiful history there. And then it was affirmed again in 397 AD at the Council of Carthage. And the apocryphal books, like I talked about, were removed from the Protestant Bible in 1534. Okay? Now, the Apocry- I'm going to talk real quick about the apocryphal books, the middle books. They get this really bad name, okay? And I've studied them in seminary. They're, they're great books. They're history. Again, our, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ will say that they are Scripture, and others will say, oh, they're great history, but I don't think they're divinely inspired Word of God. Okay. That's what I'll land on. Okay. But we see in 1534, what we have to know is when they were removed from the apocryphal books, I mean, when they were removed from the New Testament, when they were removed from the Protestant Bible, it wasn't some hateful thing. It wasn't this huge dividing thing like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you would ever think that those books. No, it's like, in our study, we think these books are different than these others. 
And so we're going to set them over here. Not to be shunned or burned or never read, but we have these books here that we think these are sure, for sure, the word of God. We're not sure about these, so we're just going to set them over here. And that's fine. Now, get to the canon. When the Council of Hippo, and again, the Council of Carthage met, <laughs> unlike what Dan Brown and his book, The Da Vinci Code, which is a phenomenal book if you want to read it, just don't take your theology from it, okay? Seriously, Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code, phenomenal book, well-written. Unlike what he would want us to believe or what other people more uh, sinister than him would try and have us believe, there was not this great debate about the New Testament canon. There was not a great debate about these 27 books. In fact, 20 of the books that we have in the New Testament had zero, and I mean zero, argument to them. This Council of Hippo was not this super long, like two-week-long meeting. It was actually a rather short meeting in the scheme of all these other councils that have happened in history. Because, again, they weren't trying to place something onto the churches. They were saying, this is what the churches are already doing. Let's just make it official. So we can stop kind of some of this argumentative nonsense. Now, there were seven debated books, and I want to be honest with you all the time, that there are seven books that were debated, and they were debated for great reason, okay? Number one, the book of Hebrews was debated. The book of Hebrews was debated because no one's really 100% sure who wrote the letter. So in the idea of choosing the book's that would be canon, that would be our New Testament, the council said, okay, they need to be apostolic, which means they need to be written by the apostles or maybe someone trained by the apostles. And so that's why Paul, most of his works got in because he's an apostle, he's writing, this makes sense. But a lot of people believe that Hebrews was either written by Peter or a disciple of either Peter or Paul not Ringo. Okay. I was waiting. Someone's going to get there like, ah, Beatles. Yes, okay. And I know, right? Like, ah, that's terrible. It's a dad joke. You'll be fine. And so everything that they included had to be no more than one step removed from the apostles. And so Hebrews, they're like, well, we don't know. We don't know. It, it, maybe, maybe we shouldn't include it. Maybe we should. But what it came down to was that the truth in Hebrews was universal, which means everyone's using it. Everyone was using Hebrews. Every major church, every major leader, they held Hebrews to such a high standard, a, such a high view that it was, the argument was rather short. The other one is that everything in Hebrews coincides with everything the apostles wrote, Okay. So it's not like it's some out-of-left-field thing. Like, okay, here we go. The Gospel of Thomas, okay? Super trendy, super fun. Google it if you want. The Gospel of Thomas is like, this is the one that should have been because it proves all this. It doesn't prove anything, okay? The, fir the earliest version of it we have is from like 500 years later. It bears no resemblance to anything that we have in the New Testament, and so everyone's like, well, because it does it, that's why it got left out. No, it got left out because it doesn't make any sense. Okay? The first church was like, okay, even if they had it, they would have read it and been like, no, that's not what those who are close to Jesus said. We don't need it. And so everything in Hebrews coincides with everything that the apostles wrote. Now we have James was the next one that was debated. James was debated pretty hard because there was concerns raised that it appears that there's a contradiction between James's view of grace and works and Paul's view of grace and works. And if you've ever read James, you're like, yeah, sure seems to be. Well, let's look at it, okay? James 2.24. This sounds a bit contradictory. James says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Interesting, because Paul says here in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Verse 9, not 
the result of works, so that no one may boast. So anytime someone says the Bible doesn't contradict itself, I'm like, mm, on its face it does. Okay, we can't, we can't hide from this apparent contradiction, okay? No, it's not a contradiction when you look at the rest of Paul and the rest of James. But on its face, at a cursory reading, it looks to be a contradiction. Except Paul's next verse shows that it's not. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand to be our way of life. And if we jump back to James 2.17, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Not that you're not saved, it's that your faith is useless. That's what he means. The whole point that James is trying to make in James chapter 2 is if you're not doing what the Bible says, your Bible means nothing to you. Now, James is the half-brother of Jesus, the younger brother. I had to ask I asked that question in college one time. Is James the older or younger brother of Jesus? The Immaculate Conception really escaped my mind there. That's okay, there's grace. James is the younger brother of Jesus, and he's trying to make this point that if you're not doing what Jesus said, your belief in Jesus is dead. And Paul says the same thing. You've been saved by grace. It's not your works that saved you, but your lifestyle should demonstrate the grace you have received. It's not a contradiction. And so when they looked at the entirety of both books, they're like, yes, okay, James needs to be in. Uh, Second Peter was the next one that was debated because first and second Peter in the Greek are so very different, Okay. One is written like uh, Shakespeare, and the other is written like a Kentucky hillbilly, okay? Like, it's just so different. And so people were like, that can't both be Peter, because one's really good, and one's mm, like a third grader. Like, this doesn't... And so what they came to the conclusion of was there's two options. Because the message is the same, Okay? So what they came to the conclusion of was that Peter used two scribes, okay? Most of the New Testament was not written by the hand of those who wrote it, okay? In some of Paul's letters, you'll even see him say, I'm writing this with my own hand, okay? Because what they would do is they'd just start talking, and a scribe would write down what they're saying. Now, in that culture... A scribe was not a court reporter, okay? In our day and age, a court reporter says, this is what was said, and I said it exactly the same. In first century Jewish culture, I wrote down what you said, but I wrote it down how I understand it. And so if you have two scribes of two different education levels, you get two incredibly different letters. Same talk. Same guy. The other option is Peter, being an uneducated fisherman, maybe he wrote one. We don't know. But at the end of the day, Second Peter came in. Uh, then you have Second and Third John and Jude were debated. And the only reason they were debated, here's the question. They're so short. Do you think they have any lasting value? But everyone's like, yes. Okay, they're in. And then the one that should shock no one, Revelation. And the only explanation is, it's revelation. Everyone's like, I don't know. Does, I, did you get I don't get it. Do you get I don't get it. But it's from John, and we know it's from John, and so John's really important. Let's, let's put it in. Revelation was so confusing, even to the first people they debated, should it be in? And so I wanted to start our discussion of, can we trust the Bible, starting looking at the New Testament and how we got it, how we have these 27 books. Now, next week, we're going to look even deeper into this because we're going to look at how early most of these writings were found, how many of these writings we have. And then we're going to, next week, we're going to answer the question of, well, what about all the translations? 
What about all the translations? Are we, are, can we have any confidence that this is what the original author said? That's next week. Now, to end this week, one of the topics that comes up a lot when it comes to looking at the New Testament is the question or the idea that the first church, the early church, didn't hold anything other than the Old Testament as Scripture. Okay? That's, that's actually, I've heard it preached multiple times, that the first church only used the Old Testament as Scripture, and that's not true. It's just not. And we have two examples in Scripture that show that. So I want you to look at these with me. We're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy 5. I'm gonna start, it's not on the screen, but I'm going to start in 17 just because I don't like starting in the middle of a, of a sentence. So verse 17 says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Verse 18. For the scripture says, okay, the scripture, the word of God says two things. You shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the laborer deserves to be paid. Okay, if we're just reading that in our daily Bible study, we're not going to think anything of that. Except this little verse shows us that Paul, who wrote 1 Timothy, was already using the words of Jesus. So let's look at the Old Testament reference. Deuteronomy 25.4, Deuteronomy 25.4, Paul being a good Jewish scholar who became a follower of Jesus later, he quotes the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, he quotes it exactly. You shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. No one's surprised that Paul, being a good Jewish scholar, would use the Old Testament to prove what he's trying to tell the first church. No one debates that. No one discusses that. But what we miss is the second part comes from Matthew 10.10. This is so cool to me. This is where I get super excited and giddy and super nerdy when it comes to the Bible because we have this moment of this very simple verse that confirms for us that Paul already had the words of Jesus when he was writing. Matthew 10, if I can get to the right place, 10.10. 10. Jesus says, he tells them in verse 9, take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, verse 10, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Paul uses wages, Jesus uses food. It's the same idea. It's the same word. And so here we have this amazing moment. And guys, we can't miss how big this is, okay? Like, it seems really small, but in the context of history, in the context of understanding that we can explicitly trust the New Testament especially, is this moment here. This, 1 Timothy was written no later than the mid-60s, A.D., no more than 30 years from the life and death of Jesus. And Jesus' words are already in circulation. They're already being passed around. And when Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he quotes Jesus. Paul, not an original follower of Jesus, is already quoting Jesus 30 years after his death. In the scheme of history, that's like eight seconds Okay? And we'll look at that in just a minute. And then 2 Peter 3.16. Let's look at that one. 2 Peter 3.16. We'll jump in the middle just for time. He says, Speaking of this as he does in all his letters, there are some things in them hard to understand. He's speaking of Paul's letters. He's speaking of Paul's letter. Sorry, verse 15 shows me that. Sorry, I didn't put it on the screen. I'll read it for you. 
We'll start in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also your beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Speaking of this, as he does in all his letters, there are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist as to their own destruction as they do the other scripture. This is amazing. Like, this is so cool, guys. Like, seriously, this is absolutely phenomenal. This letter in the New Testament is telling the readers everything that Paul wrote is scripture, the same as Moses. We have firsthand from the first church that they were using the letters of Paul already, that they were already considered scripture. So this idea that this canon of this uh, council of Hippo said, all right, we're going to form and, and, and formulate what Christianity is going to be because there's all this debate and we're going to make it this thing so it's this thing forever is absolute nonsense. The first church was already using scripture in scripture and it wasn't the Old Testament, it was the New Testament. Now one more, one more, and then we'll be done, I promise. Sorry. Okay, so we have early Christian writers. We have three guys. We have Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp. Okay, please don't name your kid Polycarp. Clement and Ignatius, that's fine. So Clement, we know, wrote in AD 96. Ignatius wrote in 108, and Polycarp in 110. They quote every book of the New Testament except 2 Jude and John. So by 110 AD, 25 of the books are already being quoted at length. Not little sentences, passages, chapters, almost the whole book of some of them. For context, Alexander the Great died in 323 BC. Arian wrote his biography in AD 130 or 140. This biography is considered to be one of the most historically accurate biographies in all of history. 400 years between the death of Alexander the Great and the documentation. Jesus, on the other hand, died AD 30 or 33, one of the two, because of the new moon and all that kind of stuff. Most people say 33. The synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written in the 60s meaning there's no more than 40 years between the death of Jesus and the documentation. Compared to 400 years, 10 times the length later, and that is considered the most historically accurate historical document. The Bible is held to a different standard than every other historical book. Because when it competes, when it stands next to every other historical document, it blows it away with its trustworthiness. Now again, we can discuss faith in it all day long, okay? But the question of today, can we trust what it says to be accurate? Absolutely. Without question, the New Testament is so historically accurate more than maybe any other thing that's ever been written. So that's what we're going to look at this week. Next week, we're going to look at translations. We're going to look at more of the timing of the writing. But guys, this week, um, I just really wanted to show you to look outside of Scripture sometimes to show you that what we hold to be life and truth and where we find the goodness of God is historically accurate. Maybe, probably, more than any other writing in the history of the world. So I'm going to pray for us. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. We're going to end with one song because I recognize that this wasn't maybe touching emotions or maybe touching uh, rah, rah, let's go change the world. I understand that. But sometimes we need to look at the facts, okay? I'm a feelings person, but every now and then we need to look just strictly at the facts to be convinced that what we experience is true. So let's pray. God, this morning we thank you so much that we can trust your word. God, thank you for giving us, even in the New Testament, glimpses of its truthfulness. And God, thank you that outside sources confirm for us 
so many things. And God, I pray that we believe the Bible. That in it we can find life and hope and truth. And God, I pray that this morning we are motivated to examine this work. That we are motivated to look at it and, and dive into it and study it. Because it's historically true. And so, God, as we read it, I pray that you bring us faith, and faith more abundantly. And may we always be so thankful that you're not a mystery, that you didn't leave us out here in the dark to be on our own stumbling, but you've given us your words, you've given us life, and let us always remember that. And so, God, as we sing one more song, true of you and and expresses our heart to you, I pray that we are doing it with such a thankful heart for your scripture, for your word. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. If I can, everyone that's willing and able to stand and worship with us, we're going to sing one more song. sing these songs as I often do every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord, come on my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got
Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. You guys sound great. Thank you for singing. Thank you for being a part of the service today. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, a nerd when it comes to this stuff, too, so I appreciate Brian kind of going deep diving for us today. I, I, that's, that's just super fun for me. But one thing that stood out to me uh, was that the, one of the first things he said was, the Bible means nothing if we don't live it out. I, it literally means nothing to the rest of the world if that meaning doesn't go through us out to people around us. It has no purpose without us. And I mean, I'm not taking anything away from God, and he doesn't need me. He has chosen to use me, but without his creation, without us living those things out, there is no reason to have it. And so we are here to be the message. That's why it's here. It's for us to communicate love and grace to everyone around us that we meet. That's why Jesus came, to live it out as an example so we could follow his example. Jesus said all those words can pass away. And if there's not love, there's nothing. So as we leave here today, I want us to be encouraged that, you know, those you know, those aren't just empty things that we try to live out and the rules that we try to follow. There's a purpose behind them, and there is a weight that we carry, not, not, you know, not as an anxiety or a worry, but a weight that we have to live out that purpose and fulfill what God has called us to be. And that shouldn't make us afraid. That should make us happy, and that should make us joyful to know that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And so we hope that you guys feel encouraged today. Thank you for joining us. If you do have need of prayer or you just want to chat, Brian will be up here. There will be people on the sides uh, at the prayer tables. Don't be afraid to come up and chat or talk or pray. We'd love to have you. Thanks again for being here. Hope you have a wonderful day and hope that spring weather continues. We'll see you next week.